Good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to the second of our carol services at Christmas tide here at St. Mary's. Uh, several years ago, we used to have just one service, and it was absolutely packed out. Uh, so for the last few years, we've divided it into two services, and thank you for your continued support. I think we've got even more here tonight than we had last night. Last night, we were quite full, but uh, quite a few of our choir numbers are down, I believe, St. Mary's and the Portage Community Choir as well, but that's the time of the year. I'd like to welcome, uh, as I've mentioned, the Spinnaker Brass, who will be accompanying us on our carols tonight. And uh, we will stand to sing them all, and the, they will be unannounced. We'll take up our collection on the second last hymn, which is the, the Calypso Carol. I was always given a tip in theological college to take up your collection during a jolly happy hymn. <laughs> uh, lovely to have the Portisar Community Choir with us again. Uh, and our own church choir at St. Mary's, marvellous uh, to have Judith Williams, our organist and pianist as well, and all the many people who've helped to make this a great evening. It's also a joy to have young people tonight from the Portsmouth Sea Cadet Corps, T.S. Alamein, of which I am the chaplain down at Whale Island, and they're going to be sharing in our service tonight various uh, stories of Christmas throughout the world. So, and we have uh, mulled wine and mince pies for you at the end and the way out, so hopefully you will avail yourself of that hospitality. So let's uh, stand as we sing our opening carol, The First Noel. <clears throat>
And now we just pause to remember, at the start of our service, the meaning of Christmas, and also to think of those less fortunate than ourselves. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we await the celebration of the birthday of your Son, Jesus, cause us to wonder that the creator of the universe emptied himself of the splendor and glory of heaven and took upon himself the feeble frame of a fragile baby. Restore in us the ability to stop, the serenity to ponder, and to gaze in wonder at the Christ child. Oh God, we thank you for the message of peace that Christmas brings to our distracted world. And we pray for peace among the nations, particularly in Ukraine. Peace in our land, in our homes, and peace in our hearts. Lord Jesus Christ, born in a stable, hear the cry of the homeless and refugee. May we not rest content till all have found a home and livelihood. Father, hear our prayers for those for whom Christmas brings added responsibilities and tensions. For those who work throughout the holidays, our armed forces, wherever they be throughout the world, hospital staff, energy workers, and the emergency forces. And we pray for those who find Christmas only increases the happiness they already have to carry. For the lonely, divided families, and for the ill, for those separated from the people they love, for the depressed and anxious, and those who face the first Christmas following a bereavement. In Christ, you embrace our happiness and our need. Give us a love that shall exclude none. And so as we prepare now to celebrate this evening, make our hearts and homes open to you and to one another, that your love may dwell in us and your kingdom grow. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, our theme tonight is something of an international one, as we're thinking about Christmas, how it's celebrated throughout the world. And from the Sea Cadets, Maya Withel is going to introduce our theme by taking us on a whistle-stop tour of Christmas throughout the world. Thank you, Maya. Christmas is a time for celebration and happiness. It is something that has been celebrated around the world for centuries. It celebrates the end of midwinter, the season's darkest days, the rebirth of new life, and the birth of Jesus Christ. Over these centuries, it has been celebrated differently in every country, with, all them, with them all having their own traditions. While much of the West, West celebrates Christmas with nativity scenes, church services, and Santa Claus, other countries around the world celebrate in different ways from, from ours with traditions that seem bizarre and strange to us. Even so, they celebrate the same ideal of what Christmas is, which has been celebrated for centuries. A country which has one of the most bizarre traditions is Japan. Although less than 1% of Japan is Christian, Christmas is, the, is a very popular holiday. In Japan, they do not have the traditional turkey roast, but instead KFC, with almost four million people having KFC as their Christmas dinner. While in Italy, they don't have Santa, who comes down the chimney to deliver presents, but instead Bufana, the Italian witch who, who delivers presents to the good children and kidnaps the naughty children for her hungry husband to eat. In Poland, Christmas Eve is the most important day in the festive season, where they have a feast normally consisting of 12 different dishes representing Jesus' 12 disciples. 
It is believed by Catholics that eating all of these courses will provide you with good luck for the next 12 months. In Germany, we share some of their traditions, with Germany being responsible for the origin of the Christmas tree, something which is a staple part of Christmas in this country and won't be Christmas without it. They also hold markets where they do a lot of their Christmas shopping. In Sweden, Norway and Finland, St Lucia Day is a special part of the Christmas season that commemorates a woman who is said to be the first Christian martyr. This celebration involves a candlelit progression where the eldest girl is dressed up like Lucia in a white gown and wears a wreath of candles on their head. Even though Christmas is celebrated all around the world in different ways, it still holds the same principle. It is a time for celebration, thanksgiving and togetherness with loved ones. Religious or non-religious, many households will be celebrating Christmas in their own way this year. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them.
You'll notice that around the uh, walls of the church there are flags of various countries. Um, and one of the flags that we have up tonight in the middle there is the USA. We've got one or two people from the United States of America. So if you're from the United States of America tonight, would you stand up? And I know there's one at the back as well. well there you are. Look at each other, yeah. Thank you. Please be seated. You are so welcome. And one of the reasons why I've asked you to stand up is because the young lady, Julia, is getting married to Jacob on Wednesday. So, every blessing on your wedding. That is absolutely tremendous. Thank you for joining us tonight. So, we could have a competition with all the various flags, and I think you would get most of them. But how many people know what country that is? Does anybody know? Mexico. Yeah, who said Mexico? Well done. Diana, aren't you impressed? <laughs> yeah. Well, Diana is from Mexico, and she's here tonight, and she's going to tell us something about how they celebrate Christmas in Mexico. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ian. Uh, thanks for knowing. Uh, my flag, yeah, this is, um, yeah, it's very nice to, to, to see that somebody knows. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how Christmas is in Mexico. And uh, for many people you might not know, but we are a nation of mixed race. So we are, um, yeah, we're in that range of uh, indigenous and European mixed. Uh, so all that is... Mexico, and because of that, we have a very broad culture because you know it's being the combination of these things. So in my um, in in my um, life, my mom uh, my mom's family is from uh, the north of Spain, uh, and my father's family is from a town in the um, well near the Pacific coast of Mexico that is called Ario de Rosales. Um, so I'm going to talk more about uh, the Mexican traditions rather than the Spanish ones because I think you might find them more entertaining. And uh, yes, and I know that somebody talked about Spain yesterday, so it might not be good to repeat. So in terms of um, Christmas with my father, I remember, in my, with my father's family, I remember that people start arriving sometime around 4 p.m. Uh, to my grandmother's house on the 24th of December. And people start arriving with dishes, and they uh, help cooking, and we start eating. And, uh, but the official dinner is sometime close to uh, 12 p.m., 12 a.m., like midnight, uh, regardless of, of your age. So you can be five or six years old, and you're still in the party at that time. And um, so for the food, that's, um, the food is, is, is quite exotic, I guess, uh, because, so we have a, a dish that is called romeritos, and that is a, a mix of, um, <laughs> I don't know how to explain this, uh, because some people find that very strange when I say that we have a sauce that has chocolate with chili, so the sauce is half spicy and sweet at the same time, and it has prawns and potatoes, and um, and also, like I, I googled this thing because I was like really not sure what this plant is, and apparently it's some sort of seaweed that they collect somewhere. I don't know, and uh, and it's it's very nice actually. And something very interesting from from this dish is that um, I don't know how many people know about chocolate, but at least the word and well the. The original chocolate is from Mexico, from Mexico City, from the Mexicas, or close to the Aztecs. And, uh, and this, this word means uh, sour water in Nahuatl. So yeah, chocolate means sour water, and it's, it's from, from Mexico, from these people, the Nahuatl, well, the Nahuatl. And, uh, and potatoes are also from Mexico. So this dish is, uh, is, is, is yeah, like this combination of, uh, of the, the prawns that I guess they were not Mexican. I don't remember, really. And uh, the other thing that we have is um, something called ponche. So this is just a very basic 
mix of water and sugar and it's very hot and then we put lots of fruits in there like guavas and a fruit that is called tejocote which is probably this size and it looks like an apple but it's uh, yellow with orange and has lots of freckles and I really like it a lot so when when we have this drink we normally need a spoon so we have to spoon the the fruits and to eat them like that and it's, uh, it's uh, something equivalent to mul wine, I guess, because Mexico City is almost 3,000 meters above the sea level, so it's very cold. It's, um, yeah, because some people think that, that we in Mexico City, we are always very warm, and it's like, no, it's actually very cold. It, it actually used to snow in the 60s, but now it doesn't because the city is very big. And uh, so we also have a salad that is uh, made with, um, with a root that is called jicama. And it's probably this size, no, well, like this size. And uh, so yeah, it, it tastes a little bit, I would say, like, um, like a carrot when it's very fresh and it's very juicy and sweet. Yeah, I think something like that. And it's a little bit earthy, I guess. And then we mix with this uh, jicama, we put beetroot and peanuts and sometimes oranges, apparently. Uh, we also have turkey, and apparently the first people that domesticated turkeys were the Aztecs. And, uh, and, and the Aztecs, of course, didn't call it turkey. We, we call it guajolote. And, uh, and it's also from Nahuatl, and it means uh, big monster. <laughs> like, I think they, they really think that it was a beautiful bird or something, I don't know. And, uh, but yeah, that's something that we also have. And, uh, and another thing is that we, we have something called tamales, which I'm not sure if some, some of you have seen or tried, which is um, um, corn dough mixed with uh, tomato sauce. And, uh, and tomato is also a, a, a word that comes from, from this, uh, the Mexicas or the Aztecs, the Nahuatl, and it means bag of water with a navel. So I don't know if you've noticed the navel of the tomatoes, but <laughs> apparently they have one. And, uh, and then the other thing is that, yeah, we're all the time like dancing, and there's lots of uh, salsas and cumbias and boleros, and people sing and dance. And, uh, and then we reach a time when um, we have piñatas. And I don't know if you know what a piñata is. I'm going to do like fast explanation. It's <laughs> like Richard helped me to, to describe this thing because I was like, I really know what to, do, to describe it. But, so it's a, it's a container like, like this. That, uh, if it's for children, it's made with newspaper. Paper, paper, newspaper, yeah. And, uh, and if it's for adults, it's um, a clay of pot, clay, yes. So it's quite dangerous because you're supposed to, to hit this thing to, to get all the things that are inside. Uh, traditionally, we used to put just uh, fruit, uh, but now we put sweets as well. And, uh, and it has this, um, how do you call it, Richard? Like beaks? Like uh, this, uh, um, pointy bits, I think that was the best description that we could get from. And it has these seven pointy bits, and each of, of these things represent a, a deadly sin. I think that's something that the Catholics like brought, and yeah, that was the way of explaining the Bible, I guess, I don't know. And um, so yeah, so you have to hit this thing. And that, but, because uh, we are like a bit crazy, so the, the way in which you have to to break the piñata is not just like there and hitting it. So the thing is that you are blindfolded and, uh, and you have a stick in your hand and then somebody turns you around like lots of times, yeah, like, like that. So you end up super dizzy and then they more or less point at you where the piñata is and when you try to hit it, your uncle that is grabbing the piñata with a rope is pulling it so you cannot reach it. So you're like, <laughs> like that, and everybody's like, ah, oh, close, close. And uh, so yeah, it, it might be a bit funny to see it in the distance. And uh, but eventually it gets broken, so then everybody jumps and gets all the fruits and, and sweets. We also have uh, fireworks, but for children. <laughs> no health and safety issues. There. So uh, yeah, so these ones that have um, 
yeah, so, so you, you, you turn them, you light them on, and you throw them to the floor, and they start to make lots of shapes. It's super amazing. I really enjoy doing that a lot. And, uh, but so, well, if, if you are wondering if we actually do something to do with the nativity, uh, we do. Because, so, there's a point in the night when uh, half of the family divides into the keeper in, the keeper, the innkeeper, and the other half is going to pretend to be Joseph and Mary. So some of them go outside the house and the other ones stay inside. And then we sing carols that answer to each other things that no, there is no place here or whatever. And uh, until we eventually reach a point where we let them in and we celebrate and then we bring out this um, <laughs> like Jesus, you know, that everybody carries around. And uh, that's, that's the, the way, like, very fast to describe how it was having Christmas with my um, family in Mexico. Following on now from Luke chapter 2. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favour rests.
Diana had a choice either to speak about Christmas in Mexico or Spain. I'm glad you chose Mexico <laughs> because Jasmine is now going to speak to us about Christmas in Spain. Thank you, Jasmine. Christmas is a time to celebrate and have fun, whether that be with family, with friends, or even on your own. As you may have guessed, not everyone celebrates Christmas the same way. For some, it's about religion, others tradition, and many opening presents and the lovely food that's on offer to eat. Just like you can see pretty little scenes in the windows of the houses of many people in the UK, people in Spain also have them. They're known as Belains, which translates to Bethlehem. However, they're not just little boxes with a few figurines in. Instead, they're elaborate scenes with farms, houses, rivers, and many figurines that represent nativity scenes. In Spain, they also put them in towns and shop windows for even bigger scenes. On Christmas Eve, many Spanish people go to church to celebrate their faith, called La Misa del Gallo, which translates to the Mass of the Rooster. The main Christmas dinner is normally eaten just before or just after the Midnight Mass. A rather unique event that takes place in Spain in the Catalonia religion is the Cagotillo, also known as the Pooping Log. The way in which this works is that there is a decorated log with arms, legs, hat and baratina, a Catalan hat, the children keep in their houses or schools close to Christmas. They feed it pieces of bread or orange every evening. Then on Christmas Eve they hit it with a stick, singing the Cagotillo song, asking the log to pure at Churon, a sweet nougat, or other sweets for them. El Gordo, the Spanish lottery, plays a big part in the run-up to Christmas. El Gordo, or the fat one, is nicknamed, is nicknamed this as it holds massive amount of, amounts of money you could win. It takes place on December the 22nd and has been held every year since 1812. The winning numbers are sang out by school children. Dia de los Santos Innocentes is basically like our April Fool's Day, but on December the 28th, people dress up, pull funny pranks, make jokes, and generally just have a laugh with one another. The three kings, Melchior, Gaspar, and Balthazar, like Santa, bring gifts to children in Spain on January the 6th. <coughs> on January the 5th, they parade through towns with animals, helpers, and children while sitting on beautiful floats and throwing out sweets. When the children return home, they leave their shoes outside for the kings to fill with presents overnight. Instead of our traditional Christmas pudding, Spanish people enjoy eating the Roscon Dores, usually on the day of Epiphany, which is on January the 6th. It is a sweet bread ring topped with crushed almonds, fruits in the forms of sweets, and sometimes stuffed with whipped cream. There is sometimes a small figure hidden inside as well, and the person who finds it first has the honor of buying the next year's Roscon. Villages, towns, and cities are laced with markets full of food and small gifts. So as you see, not everyone celebrates Christmas the same way, I like the way Spain celebrates Christmas. What about you?
Is there anybody here tonight from Australia? Okay, well, I'll just need to represent Australia because I'm quarter Australian. I know you don't believe that, but it's true. My grandfather was born in Melbourne. I'm not going to speak about Christmas in Australia, but Hayden White is from the Sea Cadets. And uh, so thank you, Hayden. In 2016, I was lucky enough to get the chance to spend Christmas with my family in Australia. We stayed with my aunt and uncle in Sydney. As December 25th is around the start of summer in Australia, I expected their celebrations to be quite different to our traditional long, cold, dark nights, festive imagery, and the story of the nativity. However, I was quite wrong. Being a former British colony and still a member of the Commonwealth, means they follow almost the exact Christmas themes and traditions that we do. They decorate Christmas trees, adorn their homes with images of the nativity, snowy landscapes, festive reindeer, plump robins, and jolly Saint Nicholas, all the while in temperatures up to 40 degrees Celsius. As we all know, it is not uncommon to look out the window at this time of year 
in the UK and see a robin or blackbird in full winter plumage scratching through the soil for a tasty morsel or two. Whilst in Australia, I was very surprised to look out the window and see very different types of birds scratching around in the heat. Would anyone like to guess what type of birds they were? Just shout out any. <laughs> well, some very good guesses, and I did hear one right answer. But what there were were sulfur crested cockatoos and ibis. In fact, ibis are like their version of our pigeons and are generally treated as pests. It, it very rarely snows in southeast Australia but it never happens during Australia's upside down Christmas in summer. And traditional Nordic pine trees cannot grow in the country at all. It's just too hot. Whilst all the advertisements and decorations so families at home gathered around a fire whilst it snows outside, Australians often take to the outdoors and celebrate Christmas in shorts and a t-shirt. We had a barbecue as our Christmas dinner. <laughs> whilst it wasn't traditionally festive, while sitting enjoying a meal with family and friends on this important day, toasting the year past and looking forward to the year to come, and being thankful for all we had whilst feeling blessed to feel with our loved ones, it was very easy to become immersed in the Christmas spirit. Australia is still predominantly a Christian country like ours, so whilst most people celebrate Christmas, there are a fair amount of people who do not. For example, my uncle's neighbour is Hindu, with that in mind, can you guess what he was doing on Christmas morning? Any guesses? <laughs> well, it's very good guesses, but he was actually cutting his lawn. I was very surprised to hear the steady hum of a petrol lawnmower on Christmas morning. Certainly not something I've ever heard here in the UK. Overall, it was very enjoyable to spend Christmas in another country and during another season. The spirit of Christmas and the importance of the nativity is not at all lost on the people of Australia. They come together as friends and family to celebrate the birth of Jesus and to hold important values such as friendship, compassion, charity and love. It was wonderful to have the opportunity to be a part of it all. That said, I am ready to throw away my woolly Christmas jumper, roast turkey and all the trimmings and sing festive carols during the long, cold, dark night in favour of shorts, t-shirt and a barbecue. <laughs> or maybe not. I hope you enjoyed this short speech. Thank you for listening.
And now for that lively one with a Caribbean feeling to it. See him lying on a bed of straw, the Calypso Carol. We take up our evening offering during this. Thank you. Christmas didn't start with Charles Dickens, not even 2,000 years ago, not even 13 and a half billion years ago with the Big Bang. Even before that, John writes, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognise him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, 
children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The theme of tonight's service has of course been Christmas around the world and we have only scratched the surface of the many ways in which Christmas is celebrated and it's reminded us that we are part of a whole worldwide family. Martin Luther King in the last Christmas sermon he ever preached reminded even the most bigoted racist that they can't leave for their job in the morning without being dependent on most of the world. You get up in the morning and reach for a sponge in the bath or shower by courtesy of a Pacific Islander. You reach for a bar of soap invented by the French. You go into your kitchen and pour yourself a coffee harvested for you by a South American. Or perhaps you prefer tea, which, although the packet says is from Yorkshire, <laughs> is actually from India or China. Or maybe your cereal of choice is Cocoa Pops, which, of course, probably comes from Ghana, as does this stole I'm wearing. And your marmalade on your toast may well be from Spanish or Israeli oranges. 
And all that even before you've left the house. Christmas is an international celebration. But is it just for Christians? Should it only be Christians who are celebrating it? Nadia Hussein, the Muslim winner of Bake Off, writes in her book about some of her favourite Christmas recipes and how to help make Christmas stress-free. As a result of writing a book about Christmas, she received criticism both from Christians who said she had no right because she wasn't a Christian but a Muslim, and she also received criticism from Muslims who said she had no right to do so because she was a Muslim. Proving the point, exactly, that for some, there's only one thing worse than an immigrant trying not to fit into British society, and that is an immigrant who does try and fit into British society. And is Jesus, whose birth we are celebrating at this time, only for the British, the Europeans, the white people, or the Christians? Well, sometimes we're given the impression that that is so. The traditional Christian iconography, from stained glass windows to Hollywood actors, portrays Jesus mainly as a blue-eyed, white Caucasian. So is it any wonder that some people from other cultures and lands see him not as one of their own, and so turn to more culturally relevant models. One of the most overlooked facts about Jesus was how everything about him did not put him into any box or stereotype, so that properly understood, he is the universal expression of humanity to the extent that he belongs to none and yet belongs to all. As the carol we will sing in a moment says, joy to the world, not just to the West. Joy to the world, the Lord is come, let earth receive her king. And it's almost as if the birth of Jesus was planned in a very exact way, not just by choice, by chance. For a start, he was born in the land of Israel, which was the very centre of the then known world, exactly between Europe, Asia, and Africa, right in the middle, touching all, yet belonging to none. He was born into a poor family, As at his presentation in the temple, 40 days later, his parents could only afford what was called a poor person's offering. And yet, in his veins flowed the blood of royalty. He was even a direct descendant of the great King David. And Matthew's Gospel, the first book of the New Testament, begins with the genealogy of Jesus. And if you try and make a study into his various ancestors, you will discover that he was truly a mongrel, as most of us here are. I am part Scottish, Irish, Australian, and Anglo-Norman, and probably other things as well. And so, in the genealogy of Jesus, we find that he was descended from Canaanites, Moabites. His ancestors were the original inhabitants of Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt, as well as various ancestors of the European people. And so he walked on this earth as a multi ethnic human being, he was neither black nor white, in which he transcends and dismantles race. He spoke three languages. Mainly he spoke Aramaic, which was the tongue of the common people among whom he lived. But he also spoke Greek, 
by which he could have conversed with the educated people. He also spoke Hebrew, by which he could read the Old Testament scriptures and join in the liturgy of the synagogue. He defied the tradition and stereotype of his culture by remaining unmarried. Yet he enjoyed the deep friendship and intimacy of men, like John the Apostle, who rested on his breast at the Last Supper, and Mary Magdalene, who dried his feet with her hair. He broke down barriers between Jews and Samaritans. He exalted the place of women, brought children right into the center of his teaching. He embraced the lepers, and the unclean were his friends. Indeed, the New Testament tells us that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile anymore, neither male nor female. And he is much more than a great teacher, a moral example, a social equalizer. For at his conception, the angel told Mary, his mother, that he was to be called Jesus or Yeshua in Hebrew or Joshua in English, meaning Savior, Savior, for he will save people from their sins. And in his teaching, while he remained faithful to the scriptures of Judaism, he refused to be bound by its rules and traditions. He taught some of the ideas of both Persia and Greece in his teaching. And he made claims about himself that no other world religious leader ever dared to. Others claimed that they were teachers of the way. He said, I am the way. Others claimed to give enlightenment. John's gospel, as we've heard read, tells us that everyone who has the light was and is actually enlightened by him, whether they know it or not. And he was not the founder of a new religion called Christianity. That was to come in later generations. As the carol says, he was born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give them a second birth. His mission was simply to bring people back into a relationship with God. And so to connect with him is to connect not simply with religion or morality, but with light and life. Jesus rejected the narrow limits of nationalism. And that's why we are celebrating tonight Christmas throughout the world. And because his love was for the whole world, his own people could not take this, and so they rejected him. But today, 2,000 years later, over 2 billion people, or almost one-third of the world's population, claim some sort of allegiance to him. For many, it's simply a cultural, traditional, or nominal adherence. But among these are millions who have discovered that in him is life, forgiven life, abundant life, contented life, healing life, and eternal life, given freely to all who receive him, who believe in his name, and who are born into a new family encompassing all races. And so we stand to sing our final carol, Joy to the World.
joy and peace. The wisdom of the wonderful counselor guide you. The strength of the mighty God defend you. The love of the everlasting Father enfold you. The peace of the Prince of Peace be upon you. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this night and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
Thank you. 